So there was the basement in Ravenna. There was my mom's apartment. There was our friend's mother-in-law apartment yeah. for a few months. There was my mom's again for two weeks. Then there was the transitional housing in Kirkland. I was able to move into the apartment we had before this one. And now we live here in Lake City. My daughter is very upset when I describe our former circumstances as homeless, because people have these uh, images in their head of what homelessness looks like. They don't even know how many people they encounter on a daily basis are actually technically homeless. When I realized that the job hunt was not going the way I hoped it would, and we would struggle to get into a lease, that was when it started settling in on me that our circumstances were very restricted. Things were much, much worse than I realized. Then from that point onward, you just start doggy paddling. Even though I went to law school and I'm aware of a lot of you know, different tools and, and strategies for getting information, this was so personal and it was so, so close up in my life. It wasn't something that I would have been able to handle on my own. One of our legal assistants actually received a call from Sarah Jessica. They forwarded me her information and I gave her a call to kind of figure out what was going on. She stated that she was having um, problems enrolling her um, daughter, uh, Sophia, into the Spectrum program. Sophia did the testing for the highly capable program called Spectrum uh, when she was in kindergarten and she got into that program. She was told that her daughter couldn't enroll in this particular program because she was homeless, she was living in a transitional shelter. Qualifying for Spectrum allows you to select any school that has a Spectrum classroom regardless of assignment area. Many more kids qualify for Spectrum than there are seats available. And because um, there had been some um, upheaval in our family, uh, the principal took it upon herself to deny Sophia the opportunity to be in the highly capable classroom. The case came in and um, Katara immediately analyzed what the issues were, whether um, the district was appropriately implementing the law around homeless students. Um, she brought it to the team. She said, I think that, that there is a violation going on here, and I think that we could do something to help this family. In addition, doing something to help this family would really help us be more effective for 30,000 other kids who may be in similar situations. Sophia's case, she didn't leave school, but she had to go into an environment that she didn't know, that she wasn't aware of, and had to kind of figure it out from this environment where she, you know, as I mentioned before, started in kindergarten, you know, where she knew the teachers, she knew the community, she was used to going there. Katara contacted the enrollment office and asked them about their procedure around the school choice forms. Um, and, you know, sort of uh, measured how much information they had and what their policies and procedures were. Sarah Jessica is an amazing advocate. She has a really good understanding of McKinney-Vento, which is the federal law that requires school districts to identify homeless students and provide them with certain services. The McKinney-Vento Act um, uses the Department of Education's definition of homelessness, which is children and youth who lack a fixed, adequate, regular nighttime residence. And that definition includes children who are in shelters, in transitional shelters, on the streets, um, but it also includes children who are living in doubled up situations. And what that means is children who are living in temporary living situations with others because they lack um, other accommodations. So it can be two families living under one roof um, because they have nowhere else to go. What's so important about McKinney Mental is it recognizes that what happens outside of school is just as important to what happens in school. Katara is incredibly thoughtful about how are we going to solve this problem instead of just automatically reverting to we're going to 
we're going to hammer somebody with the law, because that's not always the most effective way. It's about broad advocacy. I was able to submit a records request with the school district and ask them for specific kind of enrollment data regarding kind of this school choice process around the Spectrum program. Analyzing that data on a spreadsheet, you know, we were able to see like something's not adding up here. And we were able to see that, hey, you know, around this time that Sarah turned in her form, I believe in March or whatnot, there were other families that turned in their forms around this time and they were able to get their first choice. They had basically taken her form out of the queue in Columbia Legal Services. We are able to look at a serious problem like the fact that there are almost 31,000 homeless students and say, what are things we could do to help reduce that number and make sure that those kids are in school learning despite the fact that they may be going home to a shelter or sleeping in a van. And we're not just thinking, who can we sue? We're thinking, what are all of the tools that we have, of, of all those tools that we consider advocacy, which ones can we use? Katara said, okay, I'm ready to send a letter to the attorney, letting the attorney know that we are now aware and have evidence of this um, child's you know, school choice form being mishandled. And I said, go forth do it. Based on that, I think, you know, it took us like five months going back and forth with the school district. Katara told the public school's attorney that we had the basis for a federal lawsuit and that we would move forward with that if they did not um, retroactively treat her school choice form the way they should have from the very beginning. And the very next day, a, spa a spot opened up in the Spectrum classroom like magic. And so just based by negotiating and doing a little investigating, we were able to resolve the problem and get um, Sophia in her first choice. The biggest influence for me in becoming a lawyer is, is my faith, my values, as well as my family. I firmly believe that I've been blessed with the opportunity to go to law school, um, to go to the School of Social Work. I never ever want anyone to feel like they're trapped. I never want anyone to feel like they're hopeless. And if I can use whatever advocacy tools that I can to make an environment or a system better for families so that they don't feel kind of hopeless or trapped or that things can't get better, that's what I'm going to do.